It's a pleasure to be here in Singapore. When I was an undergraduate at Monash University, I grew up in Victoria and went to Monash. There was a lot of, I had a lot of friends from Singapore, Malaysia, India, and I'd come out here to visit them every now and again. My biggest memory is going to a Deep Purple concert here. <laughs> that was great. I couldn't believe it. I came here and saw Deep Purple anyway. So younger people might know that band. But. Um, so today, um, it's great to be here. Um, and I'm going to talk. Um, I'm, I'm uh, talking on behalf of the IEEE as well, um, who it's ultrasonics, ferroelectric, and frequency control. We're into the, that group does um, high precision measurements and frequency standards. So this is the team, and as was said, we're part of two ARC centers of excellence. And our lab is the Quantum Technologies and Dark Matter Research Laboratory. And here's a sort of summary of the team. Um, and we have a, a web page, and you can actually do a virtual tour if you're interested. We have uh, three dilution refrigerators and a lot of different cryogenic um, uh, capability of going to low temperature. Um, so this talk, I'm going to first talk about precision, precision technology using photons, phonons, and spins, and, and the type of technology that can come out from that. In the second part, I'm talking about testing fundamental physics and solving some major unsolved problems in physics, like what is dark matter, and does relativity and quantum mechanics break down, and is there a theory of quantum gravity? These are the sort of experiments that we have been involved with um, in the past. So first I will say I like this um, statement. Physics is an experimental science. It's experiment which guides physics. And it's good to see lots of experimental labs. I'm very impressed with the, the labs here. It's very interesting. And there was this um, statement. One accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions by Grace Hopper. Does anyone know who Grace Hopper is? Silence. Uh, well, as you can see, um, she's wearing a navy um, hat. She invented co uh, COBOL. Have you heard of COBOL? Yes. It's not so ancient. And here's a computer. So she's a computer scientist. And some of you might be, if you, you know about the new quantum computers and writing software, in the end, it's the measurement that guides us, right? It's, it's the physics. And that's what I like about this quality of a person making this statement. And that's sort of what's been guiding my career, precision measurement. So when we do a precision measurement, we generally we could do phase, frequency, energy, time. We, we have to pick an observable to measure. It could be voltage as well or something like that. And what we develop in our lab is this high Q technology. In other words, systems of very, very narrow line widths in frequency. OK. And to get low noise, you, you, you either you, you Usually, most techniques are classical when you're fighting in the lab, but when you, when you beat all these classical effects, you end up with this quantum effects. And that's all the buzz these days. We get down to this quantum limit, and we can put quantum in it and get funding. So, And with these, we can do new tests of fundamental physics. Rather than have a high energy collider, we can do precision measurement and see new physics. But this same technology has application into sensors, clock, radar, and this is very important for communications, military, and a lot of applications. And really, throughout my career, I found, I found making um, headway in this area also leads to headway here. And there's a synergy. And um, I guess the story of my career has been taking advantage of these um, translational outcomes as well. But my heart is here. But I think we have a moral obligation to do this. And you can license technology to companies and not, if you're not, that's, or you can, you might be the sort of, some, you have all sorts of students. Some people want to make money and invent new things. And, and so, so the, this is a good discipline because there's a broad range of things for everyone. And generally, this feeds back into new technology from the applications. You feed back into new technology and new ideas. So over my career, I've got about 12 patents in radar, gradiometer, sensing, and oscillators. And um, we also have done some of the best tests on dark matter, quantum gravity, and relativity. So the first, there's precision measurement technology. There's a whole range of different, um, different sort of sectors you can use. It could be the photon sector, where you, you, 
in the low frequency will be an LC circuit at sort of intermediates, it might be some sort of, uh, you know, strip line cavity or some resonator up to optics. So we work in this area. We have microwave RF. Um, we do a little bit of optics. And then phonons, we, all, we have worked in building low loss mechanical systems for precision measurement as well. They could be structures or bulk acoustic waves and spins. So for example, there's a big effort into magnons, um, spin waves, um, we've worked in that area, and ensemble of spins in materials. And of course, there's all the atoms, but that's not our area of expertise. There's other people like here who have that expertise. Um, so, but there's a range of things you can use. And sort of my career started up out with this technology. It's called a high-Q sapphire resonator. It's a bulk piece of sapphire that you will get fairly pure. And um, this is a, what we call a crystal dielectric resonator. We can excite microwaves in these resonators, and generally they're very low loss. The crystal, a lot of crystals are anisotropic, so the permittivity in one direction will be different to the other direction. Uh, and they have a high quality factor and a narrow nine line width. The permittivity of sapphire is on the order of 10, and therefore if you don't want your photons to leak, you have to have a fairly high order mode, and they're called whispering gallery modes. Some of you might have heard of whispering gallery modes. I were working on them since the 90s in Sapphire at microwave frequencies. And here's a range of different crystals we've looked at over the years that makes a nice photo. So I can talk about this Sapphire resonator. Um, it's a, we make oscillators out of these resonators, and we generate a precision frequency or, or phase or time timing standard. And basically, um, we house this resonator into uh, a cavity, and then we have to control everything. When you're doing something precision, it becomes control systems, and you have to call, control the temperature, we have to cool to low temperatures, um, et cetera. Um, so what happens when we do that? Um, we have a, two probes which transmit microwaves, which then start to oscillate around this sapphire, and we measure a transmission line with a certain bandwidth, and the Q is just the ratio of the bandwidth to the frequency. And um, in Sapphire, we get Qs on the order of 10 to the 9 at 10 gigahertz. And you can have, get higher than this. We can approach 10 to the 10. So you're looking at 10 gigahertz with 10 to 1 hertz line width in these resonators. So the extremely narrow line width. And a, so this is a greater than a billion microwave frequencies. So here's some examples of the oscillators we built. Now, we used to use liquid helium. Now they use um, cryo-cooled system. This is from Cryomech. And you can see the microwaves here. And inside, there's one of those resonators. And they, um, we're, I joined um, a, a while ago. We have some uh, papers, which review papers, which describe this technology. But in the end, you can get quite easily parts in 10 to the 16 in frequency stability. This is what we call LLM deviation, which is a two-sample variance. But um, no matter how you measure it, your stability over a certain averaging time um, from one second to now, you can, this is even being dragged out longer, um, is very, very good. Um, so back in those days, it generated a lot of interest. And you can buy these products. There's a, there was a company, which I'll, which I'll talk a bit about, in Perth, uh, in Fremantle. Now there's another company with my colleague, Andre, has moved to Adelaide and started selling these as well. Um, plus, we're working with this company to build other products. So that's what I mean. If, you, if you're the academic type, you don't have to do that. You can just license technology and get some benefit. So um, these oscillators, so one of our oscillators forms the heart of the Paris Observatory clock ensemble. So back in the year 2000, we, we transferred a cryogenic sapphire oscillator operating at 12 gigahertz. And there's this thing called the Dick effect. When you're sampling atoms, you get aliasing. So if the phase noise of your oscillator is not good enough, you won't get the timing accuracy or frequency stability that you want out of your clock. So, and um, it's basically aliasing because you're not measuring all the time, you're just sampling. Uh, so this was very important because the normal quartz oscillators weren't good enough to get to the quantum projection noise limit. So, and now this is the same, this is true of qubits now too. Qubits have the, exactly the same problem. Um, we are working with a group in Sydney, Mike Biercik, which uses these trapped ions 
and um, they use a cryogenic sapper oscillator to, to generate their, their pulse for their qubits. It's not as simple as a pulsing here for a clock. It's, it's more complicated, but it's still the, basically the same. So we're trying to build, they, we looked at their synthesis and we could easily improve that. So um, we're working with them in this center of excellence to help them improve. And this is gonna be a big thing for um, quantum technologies. They all need low phase noise oscillators. So there's a sort of resurgence. It came for clocks and now for qubits. So these will need them and other systems will too. And where did this start? It started, uh, I started my PhD trying to measure gravity waves with a big acoustic detector, which would then interact with a parametric transducer. This was, um, um, quantum optomechanics before it had the name. <laughs> and we even did the first resolved sideband cooling of a mechanical system before the name was out. We just called it, um, uh, we called it cold damping in the regime where you could do quantum non-demolition, but that's actually what you call resolved sideband cooling. The, the, the atom guys were using that terminology, but the acoustic guys weren't. That came later in the new wave of this stuff. But back in the in the 90s, we, my PhD was working on this huge opto-electronic uh, system. And we did some PERS that weren't properly recognized because in, in those days it was just classical. And so that was my PhD, 89 to 93. And um, now, if, I, if I just go back, one of the most important things of, of this um, readout, and we knew then, was the phase noise of the pump there's a, there's a motion transducer here, which is a reentrant cavity. And as these acoustic oscillators oscillate, it puts sidebands onto your microwaves. So um, we had to build a low noise oscillator and we had to build a low noise readout system. And, this, and both of these became te um, technology in low phase noise oscillators, which I'll explain. This was basic research just to measure out vibrations at a really small level. So, the oscillator work that I was doing is based on this model called Leeson's model where you get positive feedback into a resonator and you, you, you get noise from an amplifier which is integrated within the bandwidth but just the amplifier noise outside. Um, so that's easy to model. It's called Leeson's model. I won't get into that. But it depends on the amplifier phase noise and the cavity Q. So you want a low noise amplifier and you want a high Q. So my PhD su supervisor used to say to me, high Q, good, low Q, bad. So that was a... <laughs> so uh, anyway, so the oscillator phase noise spectrum has these power laws. So you look at the spectral density of phase fluctuations as a function of Fourier frequency, and within the bandwidth of the resonator, it's amplified, and outside you get just the amplifier noise. That's basically the physics. So we started looking how to cancel, it, cancel the noise inside the bandwidth. So we'd simply just reflect off a resonator, use a mixer. In optics, you don't have a mixer, which is unfortunate. So you can just split it, and this becomes a phase detector, and then you do a low-pass filter back to a phase shifter in your, in your um, oscillator um, uh, feedback, and you can cancel the noise. You can measure it and cancel it. So this is what happens. You cancel the noise here. And so we started working in that area because we started working on low noise oscillators and we came up with this idea. It's called a carrier suppression interferometer, which we developed in, in uh, 93. And it, if designed properly, only depended on thermal noise in your system, even though you had a large signal. And this was licensed to Poseidon Scientific Instruments in Fremantle, and they started selling these all over the world because when we first turned on this system, we measured a phase noise 1,000 times lower than what has ever was ever done before. So we're in the lab, we turn it on. There was myself, Eugene and, a PA, Eugene and a PhD student, Richard. We turned it on, it worked straight away. It was a little bit of a fluke because there was a few complications, but, um, and we saw in front of our eyes, phase noise on an oscillator 1,000 times lower than ever before. And of course we got out the champagne and the way it worked, this is the, we couldn't publish to 1998 because the company wouldn't let us. Um, so that was five years later. And the reason why we could publish, because someone at NIST worked out what we did and was thinking they'd done something new when we'd been doing it for five years. So then the guy said, okay, get your publication out. But this is what it looks like. You have an oscillator, you split it. If, you, if I want to measure the phase noise of this device under test, what we have is a, a carrier suppression interferometer here, 
where we take, uh, we've got a bright port and a dark port, and in the dark port you have the phase noise sidebands but no carrier. And when you have no carrier going into an amplifier, um, amplifiers, if you put high power in there, they've got flicker noise. If you put no power in there, they've got, they're just limited by their noise temperature. So here we have an amplifier, which, is, which has got the sidebands of the device under test, the phase, noise, the phase sidebands, but no carrier. So this is operating like an amplifier with nothing going in. It's at its noise temperature. Then we go into the mixer, and basically you, you reduce the noise floor of this mixer by the gain of this amplifier. And this, this is what gave us the, uh, this was the technology that we patented and gave us the, the uh, advantage. Uh, and so we, we measured so, such low phase noise that had never been measured before, and we've been working on this ever since, and we're still working on it. Now we're doing cryogenic systems, and we've got some, we've still got good ideas in this domain. The phase detector itself we, is was the same phase sensitivity as LIGO. LIGO is on about, if you look at it as a phase detector, it's about this. And these systems are about the same. And that's because they've got, they're pretty much uh, like each other. It's just, a, it's just an interferometer. So um, uh, without feeding back to the oscillator, we can just look at this as a microwave interferometer with very low noise with your low noise amplifier and, and your high phase sensitivity. And the best we did was with Waveguide. We got down to really low phase noise in these phase detectors. So then this company started producing these really low noise oscillators and they became very popular around the world. And sometimes they would, the, whoever their source was, need to buy them again because they would destroy them. So you could guess what the application was. Um, but anyway, the, the idea was to make them very compact and have rack mounted ones for researchers and compact ones for other applications. But now this company in Adelaide is trying to reproduce these oscillators because in the end, it would be, what happened is that um, Raytheon was, in all of Raytheon's defense radar, radar had this technology. In, all, in, the, in Raytheon, all of it has this. So they bought the company out and took the technology and stopped selling the devices. So you couldn't buy them anymore. So they've got the, they just kept it for themselves. And I've seen talks by Raytheon and it's still in all their in all their radar systems, defense radar systems. But the patents are run out, so now you can build them, and this company in Adelaide is trying to build them again. And now there's a resurgence in low noise due to qubits. So these oscillators can be important again if you want to excite qubits at a certain frequency with low noise and not have all these um, aliasing effects. So uh, now we've got a program where we're developing, we've developed this maser, um, there's impurities in, in, in these crystals at low temperatures, and we can get a three-level system. And we've got quite a few publications on that, but we're also using it as a sensor to maybe look at WIMP dark matter. Um, we're also these low noise oscillators where we excite two modes and we can look for axions. So we can also, so not only can we put it in our defense systems, we can do use these to test fundamental physics. And here's the basic oscillator. And which follows Leeson's model and gives you your integrated noise within the bandwidth, and this is how we defeat that noise. We reflect off, we, we use this um, uh, microwave interferometer, we tune it up with, balance the two sorts of sides, amplify, phase detect, and feed back and cancel the noise. And it works really well. And now we can say, we're building cryogenic versions of this. We've, we've come up with some new sort of minor discoveries on how to do this. Um, and we hope to make cryogenic versions of these low phase noise oscillators, not just the high stability, um, which are the other type. Um, so we have this, the, one of the ways we do it is we suppress the noise with the resonator itself by using filtering. And we hope that um, we, when we've worked out the best ways to do this. Now I'll talk about the, another area I got into because of this research. My research started off in gravity waves building oscillators, but then you want to understand sapphire because how, how does sapphire work well? Well, how can you make a high stability oscillator out of sapphire? Well, the magic was here. When you measure the frequency versus um, temperature, there's a turnover point at 8 Kelvin in this sapphire resonator. 
So if I control the temperature to here in the cryogenic environment, and I just heat up a bit, you, that's when you get the good result. So why does that happen? Why is there a turnover point? And it turns out it's because of spins, residual spins in the system. So if I take a pure piece of sapphire like this, there's an order of parts per, per billion spins in there. And those spins um, supply a magnetic susceptibility to the lattice. So the lattice will, has a T to the fourth dependence. So you, you just, as you tune it, the dielectric constant changes and there should be no turnover point. But the susceptibility, um, depending if you're uh, below the, um, the transition of that paramagnetic impurity, uh, op gives the opposite effect. And so they directly cancel and allow you to, give, to do this. And the, the funny thing is, we can buy nearly any piece of sapphire, which is high purity, and it always has a turning point between 4 to 10 Kelvin. And it can be different impurities. It's sort of like magic. It's just that's where it happens. We did buy one that was at 2 Kelvin. It was the highest Q1 we had. It was very pure, but it was useless because we couldn't use it in a 4K system, and, shoot, and even though it was a real, the best sample. So this is, this is absolutely magic, you know? That turning point exists, and it exists. It doesn't matter if I have chromium, Fe3+, plus, or whatever in there. It's always around there. You do the calculation. There's some T to the 1 on 4 dependence that makes it happen. I can't remember. So then we started looking at different types of resonators. We had the sapphire. We also we, we coupled um, nano diamonds to a rutile resonator with some guys at Macquarie. We worked with uh, guys, Pavel Bushev, to look at YSO and load them in a cavity. So we started, we started understanding spins, and then the quantum thing came in, the quantum center, and we wanted to, to look at photons interacting with spins. We also, these reentrant cavities is what we used as a readout for the gravity wave detector. They're very interesting. They're lumped circuits. There's a capacitance here and inductance here. And then we worked out if you could have arrays of them, you sort of get topological systems. And um, so we have a few papers on that as well. So here's, I'll show you this because when we got our first dilution fridge, the first thing we wanted to do was put sapphire in there and check it out. And sapphire is multi-mode. It has a lot of whispering gallery modes. So what you see across the horizontal here is the whispering gallery modes. And what you see as we apply a magnetic field, a DC magnetic field, um, these, we see um, spins interact with the whispering gallery modes. And we put a dot every time they go through. And we can get a map of all the spin impurities in the sample. So this is pretty cool. It's very high precision spectroscopy. We saw Fe3+, Cr3+, vanadium, 2+, some unknown big thing, probably rare earth. Um, uh, Fe, we, and we, we could predict, because back in the 60s, they did a lot of crystal field theory to do these predictions, and we could match it easy with the theory. So that was pretty good. We could see all that. And um, the reentrant cavities, when I was working on gravity waves, we, this is a displacement sensor, but I always wondered what happens if I have more than one post. And then Maxime came along, started working with us, and he said, "Let's." And, and we, 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 these spheres started to get popular. This is back in two, this is one of the first paper of, of coupling um, photons with magnons, um, and we delayed it because we got a patent on this. Um, we, we noticed that these are basically lump circuits. So if we have a reentrant cavity, which acts as two capacitors and two inductors, if these two electric fields are in phase, then this whole post, this whole two, two system acts like a single post and expels all the magnetic field outside. But if they're out of phase, it puts all the RF magnetic field inside. That was a pretty, I thought that was pretty cool because I didn't know any system that could concentrate the magnetic field, into, the RF magnetic field into a small point. And if you constantly then put your Yig sphere there, you get a huge coupling. And when we measured that, um, and we, we decided to patent this, um, turns out that um, IBM would, had some similar patents because I wanted to use these as buses. I, I visited them, and then I tried to sell them our patent, but they never took up on that. I was trying to get a bit of money for research. But um, you know, you do anything once you get to this level to get money. Um, so anyway we got huge couplings of gigahertz, and no one ever saw such strong couplings in the past in, in any other system. And you can see that that's really strong coupling. Um, our best to date is now we've got a, on the order of six gigahertz couplings between photons and these magnons. Yeah, huge couplings. 
So we even coupled to Diamond. Um, we, the goal was to couple to NV centers, but in the end, we this sample we had didn't have many NVs. It had P1 centers, but we still coupled strongly to them. Um, so it just shows you that um, from one project leads up to a whole lot of different physics. Another interesting idea, which I'll put out there in the translational area, is that this, um, my friend Alexi here, had this idea to use uh, acoustic resonator to measure gravity gradients. So we teamed up together in a precision, precision of the mechanics, really, where we now have, a, instead of having a gravity wave bar with a reentry cavity, we've got this S-shaped resonator, which is sensitive to gravity gradients. It's a gradient along there. It's got special boundary conditions. We haven't quite published. He's published a paper on the theory um, and calls it Taipan, because that's a, anyone heard of a Taipan? It's a poisonous, most poisonous snake in Australia, but it's, um, it doesn't attack because it's pretty much scared of everything. So this looks like a, uh, so what happens with this mode, it's insensitive to the common mode gravitational effect, but it's sensitive to the differential. So this was a new idea and we drive with low phase noise. So this, we're working with a company on this, Lockheed Martin. Um, so I just thought I would show this as to show you the sort of translational technology that you can get involved in. Um, and so this shows the reentrant cavities. Um, and there here is a test match where you can measure the gravity gradient. Yeah, so it's pretty, and it's small, so it could be, so um, Lockheed Martin's the only company that um, leases gravity gradiometers, so they're still funding this. So now I'll talk about new physics, um, about searching for physics, new physics, and first I'll talk about dark matter. Now, dark matter, we know it's all around us. You hear this all the time. Um, so the dark matter halo is here right now. And so if, if, the, if they're particles, they're in this room right now, and we can try and detect them. And there's all these different, so it'll be all around us. And there's all these different um, evidence that, that shows that it's not just a modification of gravity, but it actually should be a particle. This is a typical bullet cluster where the luminous matter and the actual um, matter is a different center of a mass. Um, so it's passing through us. So the question is, does dark matter interact with standard model particles? Can we convert dark matter to a standard model particle? Because that's what we want to do if we want to detect it. Can we use precision measurement to search for dark matter? And obviously the answer is yeah, we can try if we think we know what it is. But the question, what is it? No one really knows what it is. We only know from its gravitational in interaction. But the, the, the matter that we know is of only a very, very small amount of the universe. So it's a significant problem to understand. So candidates for dark matter. The problem is there's all these theories of dark matter that range such a variety of masses from very low to very high. The very high one, ones were the popular a few decades ago because supersymmetry seemed to suggest that um, you would have this high mass wimps. However, those experiments have failed and now it's becoming more popular to have, to think of it maybe as this low mass, um, uh, what, what we call wave-like dark matter. And one of the best candidates is called the axion because it solves the strong CP problem. The strong charge parity problem was why a neutron doesn't have an electric dipole moment. And when you do the calculations, it should be created in the early universe if it, if it exists. So, it could, so these low mass experiments will appear in experiments by a wave phenomena rather than individual quanta, which occurs up here. So you need precision experiments to do this. And um, so in our dark matter center, our group is down here. We have this experiment called Organ, and we're also part of the ADMX collaboration, which is sort of the, the biggest, it's been the longest serving axion type experiment in the world. Um, and so our center of excellence is, is geared on these two areas, just looking for dark matter. So a generic experiment, a wave like dark matter experiment could be some sort of, um, like I put before, some sort of um, precision measurement, but maybe there could be photons, um, it could be some sort of spin, magnetic resonance, or it could be an atom, 
but you, you, you've got to, this physics pa package should be sensitive to the dark matter you're looking for. You have to do calculations. So you've got to design this physics package, make it sensitive to the type of dark matter of interest. It could be an axion, a dilaton is a scalar dark matter. Uh, and, and we have to have the theory of how it interacts with the experiment. So the theorists have to tell us this. And there's a lot of theorists out there telling us this. So it makes life good for an experimentalist. You can, and we have to, we have to reduce fundamental noise. We've got to, we have to, and it ends up being quantum metrology in the end. Uh, when you class, when you surpass the quantum limit. So wave like, Dark matter program at UWA. First, we're, we're part of the we've become part of the Axion dark matter experiment. We're contributing to that. Some of our students, uh, uh, well, one of them went over to the collaboration meeting just recently. Um, we have this oscillating resonator group Axion experiment, which is just currently we did our first scanning publication came out. Um, we have this one which which uses low noise oscillators which I sort of mentioned before. And we're looking at low mass um, lumped element systems as well. And we also you can use these magnon cavities to search for dark matter, which couple to electron spins. And the interesting thing is one model of axions won't couple to electron spins, another model will. So in the end, if we detect the axion, we can use this to sort of look at which model is correct. And then there's light scalar dark matter, which are like a dilaton, and they might um, couple to different um, observables. So there's a, there's a couple of papers in this area that our students have put out recently. And what I will focus on first is the axion and why it should exist. This was dubbed by Frank Wilczek. Um, he named it after this dishwashing or washing liquid um, because he told me personally when we were here five years ago, that it was because he thought it would be a cool name for a particle <laughs> when he was a kid. And I thought, oh, OK, already thinking of particles. And he's still actively around giving talks on this. Um, and then there's Pierre Sakivi, who first came up with the axion haloscope, how we use a high magnetic field at low temperatures to convert axions into photons. And this is this was what he came up with. So if if axion is dark matter, it's everywhere around us now. And, um, and if we make, and it will couple to two photons, if we make one of these photons a DC magnetic field, because a DC magnetic field is a source of photons, you all know that, right? It's virtual photons, but it's just a photon at zero frequency and they're virtual. Um, so in the finum picture, you've got all these photons coming up. So one photon is DC and your other photon then is converted from the mass of the axion to the frequency. So the frequency that you should detect is directly related to the mass. And how do we do that? Here we have our big magnetic field, we have our axion, and what we do here is we tune a cavity, because if we have a high Q cavity, we can sort of uh, enhance the photons. So this is your typical, so if you look back at that diagram, there was this coupling term that couples the axion to the two photons, which is the A gamma gamma, and in, GA, in GEV to the minus one, this is your coupling. And um, the QCD axion models predict couplings versus mass here. And then we have these experiments that try and get down to here. But the early universe axions are actually easier to couple to. And now there's theories that show that the QCD axion could be anywhere. This is why theorists are good. They can say, oh, hang on. They're called photophilic or photophobic axions. Don't ask me about them. You know, my theory is not that good to know what they are, but I can sort of understand. And what it means is just the assumptions made here have been relaxed. And actually, your QCD axion could have um, be up here or down here. Um, anyway, so they could be these uh, predicted. So there's this paper which predicts these axions to be created in the early universe. So now we can start trying to rule those out. And um, so this is our dilution fridge when it arrived. We got funding to, we've got three dilution fridges, two for quantum sort of stuff and one for dark matter, but we just use them as we please. And our experiments up here at high, much higher masses than where everyone else is looking at. Why are we up here, you might ask? It's because this model predicts that the axion's here. And this is a, uh, this model is a standard model, axion C saw Higgs model, which solves six problems apparently in one theory, 
And so we should, so we thought that was a good reason to look up here. Another good reason that we should look up here is because we're got we're very good at those frequencies where all these other guys are not. But our background of using microwaves naturally put us up here as well. So that's why we chose there. And we just had this published this published this month, and it's our first scan, and it's in Science Advances, and uh, we we put um, we put the first limits in this re re region where this um, axions uh, predicted. Also, lattice QCD predicts them to be here too. So it's a good reason. Um, and so this was our first experiment, and this is our, uh, we ruled out some of these ALP cogenesis axions. Um, there's some gaps here. That's just because there's mode crossings in our oscillators, and we know how to get rid of them now, but we wanted to get our first paper out, of course. And we have a run plan. We have a run plan to scan and get down to the QCD axion um, limits. I won't go into this too much because of lack of time, but the, the most important thing to be able to do this is actually quantum technologies. Um, you To build a readout that will be in quantum technologies. We have these, these tunable resonators which can scan. And the annoying thing is that the, the modes that couple to your axion are the transverse magnetic modes, and they're independent of length. So you can't tune them with just a plunger. You have to move the radius. How do you move the radius? You know, well, physicists are always in, they they can work things out. They just put a rod in there and stir it, and and sort of stir it around, and you can sort of tune it. So that's how it's done, which is a, a bit annoying. But this is what we have to develop at these frequencies to get to the standard to get to the QCD axion. We have to develop a single photon detector, and in Equus we are trying to develop this. We had a student working on this. And we're still working on this. We finally got this device working. We had a few problems, um, but it's basically a Josephson junction, and we're trying to use it to um, um, detect uh, single photons. Uh, ADMX, we're part of this collaboration. They're already using quantum technologies on their readout. They use parametric amplifiers, um, and they tune them, and they scan them. And they've been able to put limits down at the QCD axion at frequencies on 650 megahertz to a gigahertz. We're looking up at 15 gigahertz to 50 gigahertz. They have a higher frequency one too, and we've been involved in this work. There's another interesting effect is that um, gravity, gravity waves uh, can be converted into photons under a high magnetic field as well. And this has been known for a while, uh, it's called the inverse Gerhenstein effect. I don't know if you've heard of that, but if I have a gravitational wave and I get a high magnetic field, I can use a photon, it will convert to a photon. And this, this was just published in PRD, and it, it tells us how to do that. And there's another one um, which has just came out, uh, uh, and it shows you how it's converted, how gravity waves are converted into photons in a cavity. And it turns out that axion detectors are actually sensitive to gravity waves as well, which is interesting because I used to work on gravity waves, as you, I just told you. And here's our experiment here. They did an analysis for our experiment of, of uh, what sort of sensitivity we could get. Um, of course, it could be better than that because it's, it's, um, we, we've actually got better results now. And there's this effective current that creates an axion, which is proportional to the DC B field. Um, and that there's an effective current that's generated that interacts uh, with a magnetic field, uh, which will interact with your microwave cavity for gravity wave as well. And they've identified that the sensitivity, the strain sensitivity is the same as this axion theta angle, which is your coupling to by times your axion scalar field. So that's very interesting for someone who's worked on gravity waves before. So ultra-high frequency gravity wave motivation is that um, uh, there's, if we detect, we know we now know we can detect gravity waves, right? Uh, do higher frequency ones exist? The people working in there say, oh, it's very unlikely the whole universe will collapse if they do. But of course, you know that they probably will. If, you know, just as an experimentalist, if my gut feeling is there's probably sources out there. And... Uh, any discovery of gravitational waves at higher frequency would indicate new physics beyond the standard model. So it's worth having a look. 
and there is exot exotic sources which are predicted. Uh, so we're looking at we're, we're looking at this, um, and Dave Tanner, who's at University of Florida, is also working on axions and gravity waves, and we've put in a grant with him to. So as we're searching for axions, we can just use instead of the axion template is what is the axion template when I'm searching for an axion? Well, the dark matter halo is virialized, and so it's basically a narrow band noise source with an effective Q factor of part and 10 to the 6. So it's got a line width of part and 10 to the 6, so you can integrate it co coherently for a certain amount of time and then you can't anymore. So we have to take that into account when we're looking for it. And then there, there, there might be sources from the galaxy coming in more coherently you know, you could do axion, if we, if we do discover the axion, we could do axion astronomy, and you can look at those, and they'll be much more narrow than the galactic halo. Um, and then you can look at the, you know, Doppler effects and things like this. Um, so the, the, as a gravity wave, it's just another, you, we can just treat it like a different type of axion. We can put templates and search. Um, so it wouldn't be much to just change our, because uh, we, because what, ADMX does, they do a high resolution analysis looking for cold flows from the center of the galaxy, and they also look for the galactic halo, and each has a different filtering technique. So all we have to do is develop a, new, a different filtering technique and look for gravity waves. That's all we have to do, um, just do it after the fact. And so, yeah, so we look here. Um, so this, some predicted sources, and here's some predictor sensitivities of some axion detectors. And we've also built these bulk acoustic wave detectors, which are little resonant ones that can search for gravity waves. So I like to look at this. This is this, this LIGO. They use strain sensitivity per root hertz. I've worked out how to do that for axion detectors because I worked in both domains. No one's worked that out yet, but it's not that difficult. Um, so we can look at in a, if these will be the sensitivity of ADMX in terms of just instrument noise. It looks good, but it's also higher energy. So, you know. Um, also, um, we've used our technology to look for Lorentz invariance uh, violations when there's a background field. So I'm now moving on from the dark matter and tell you uh, we did this precision test of Lorentz symmetry with, um, with uh, sapphire resonators and they basically like a Michelson Morley experiment. Um, so this is all the theorist behind this is Alan Kostoleski, where you have these background fields and they, they might give you might see signals. And these are effective field theories with a, a Lagrangian with with all known Lagrangians plus all possible Lorentz violating background fields. And you could do it in, in a different types of sectors. We had this rotating experiment in the past. And we published quite a few papers on this in the past, just to show you. So this is the same technology that can be used for radar and things like that. And we moved our, um, they had a better rotation system, so we moved our, our experiment to Berlin with um, Akim Peters. And we did a, our final work was with him, and it's still currently the best limit, lab limit on Lorentz violations. And there's these standard model parameters, I won't get into it. This is a delta C on C. Um, anyway, and we've done the same thing with phonons. Phonons you can use as well. A quartz oscillator is based on phonons. It's a bulk acoustic wave resonance, and this bulk acoustic wave resonance um, is based the acoustic equivalent of the Fabry Perot cavity. It is it's shaped like a like a mirror, and all the oscillations are in the middle, so there's no uh, uh, suspension losses, and you get extremely high cues in this system. Um, and they're piezoelectric, so they're easy to read out. When we cool to those temperatures, you can get acoustic cues of 10 to the 10. This technology is really very good. And we use these acoustic phonon resonance. We use them to do a, a Lorentz invariance experiment with Holger Muller in Berkeley. Um, our first, and we've, we've got a whole bunch of data from, in, from our lab, but we just haven't analyzed it yet because um, we have, we're doing a bunch of things, but we've got the data and we need to, to put new limits. In the, in, with these phonons. Um, and the other type of experiment we're looking at is that um, that's, it's relativity modified, this is quantum, is quantum mechanics modified. So the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship, the commutator relationship might be modified if we have, if there's a, if we have a big mass. 
And this paper was published a while ago, which sort of sent people looking at maybe we can we can we can test this, put get a look at what happens when you have a big mass. So is quantum mechanics possible with macroscopic ma masses? Does the mass modify the position of momentum commutator relations? Quantum gravity theories predict the nonlinear corrections to the canonical communication commutation between position and momentum. And we can test this with precision optomechanics. So this is this paper with Pavel Bushev and Stefan Danilich, who's a theorist and, and a friend experimentalist, came up with this idea that if this commutator was changed, there'll be an amplitude to frequency conversion. So now we're just looking for this, trying to measure an amplitude to frequency conversion in this experiment. Precision. So we searched for low energy signals of quantum gravity. We want to detect a change in the commutator from gravity corrections. Um, there's this amplitude frequency effect, uh, and that's what we will look for. And um, we measure this amplitude of frequency effect in a, in a high mass system. And we can either be a bore or a sapphire. That's what we've used. And uh, that's what this did. We put new limits on this in this paper. Uh, we modeled first the sapphire transducer. We could model all the acoustic modes in there. Then we could model how they interact with the whispering gallery modes. So this is a, a big sapphire bar. Uh, with, which has an acoustic modulation and the strain dependence and the, uh, modulates the frequency of these and we have an, a, a transducer. Here is a uh, suspended in a system and we can turn this into an oscillator even. And we measured the ring down with, radi we could excite this system with radiation pressure. We excite it with radiation pressure and watch it ring down. In the end, this is what we used to put limits. It wasn't a, a precision measurement. We're just using ring down curves because we did this experiment before this idea. Now we have to redo the idea in a more precision way. We can make make huge uh, difference. Uh, the experiment used a low noise oscillator, uh, then coupled to this bar, uh, and we put best limits. But if we did a proper experiment where we where we say integrated for a while and change the amplitude of vibration and look for these nonlinear terms we could easily get into this regime where you might see something. But we haven't done that yet because it's just another thing. Um, the, other, the last thing I'll talk about, because I'm getting close to time, is that how we use these acoustic um, devices to look for gravity waves. This is done with our PhD student and my, my ex student is now a professor in Glasgow. He's an expert on data analysis for gravity waves and Serge Gaillot, who's developed this acoustic technology. And um, this is basically a little gravity wave detector. We couple it to a squid amplifier. We did a proposal paper where we showed that it would be quite sensitive. We, we cooled these downs and we measured the thermal noise, the acoustic thermal noise in these systems. And then we, we actually ran this for, for 150 days. Uh, and it was published last year in PRL. And it basically uses a squid. Um, and we, we, we measured two modes with lock-in amplifiers. Um, down converting that. And we saw out of all 150 days, we saw one event in the first part of the experiment. And this event occurred in mode two, which was at 5.5 megahertz, but not in mode one. Then after we had a break, we thought, let's put two near five megahertz. And then we saw another event and occurred in both modes. And if we look at the histograms, you get these high energy events, but these high energy events, if we look at the actual two events that we saw, all these high energy events from the whole data can be explained by these two events that we saw. And so that was a bit of a mystery. It got a bit of publicity that we saw two events. Who knows what they are? Um, but we're setting this experiment up again. It's called the Multimode Acoustic Gravitational Wave Experiment MAGE. And we're going to have multiple, um, measure multiple modes with FPGAs and different bores. Uh, and this is what the student drew up that's like that. Uh, we found that there's another experiment with the same acronym, but we're not going to change because I look, this is too good with the courts here and so on. Uh, uh, so we, we've, I've put in a funding application for this along with the Axion stuff, and we hope to, to get a high number of modes and just look and see if we see more events. So it could be we need a cosmic particle veto system. Uh, some Italians are interested now. We're going to have a meeting with them, and they want to build one underground or something. Anyway, 
I won't go, I'll finish now, that's the end, it's a good time to finish. Um, 50 minutes is what my time was. And Sorry if I covered a lot of stuff, but uh, uh, thank you.